Hello, Hello everyone. everyone. Thanks, Thanks so much, much for joining, joining me. me. I, I know it's uh, a little late or early, should I say, for some, some, some people. people. But it looks like uh, we got a lot of people all over the world, so that's really cool. I'm glad you're here. I'm sorry I'm looking over there because that's where the screen with all the comments are. So if I look over there, it's because I'm reading you. But I hope you're doing great today. This is kind of a little bit of a last minute thing, but I just wanted to hang out with you guys and answer your questions if you have any, play a little bit, uh, maybe ask you some questions and just kind of kind of have a good time. And sometimes the YouTube thing can, be, uh, can feel a little bit disconnected where um, it can seem to be one way. I don't want that. I've never wanted that. I always wanted my ideal scenario would be in this, to be in the same room with, with all of you and just kind of interact. So I'm gonna make sure the sound's okay. Uh, as long as you can hear me, that's great. Looks like there is an echo. I'm sorry. Really? Okay. Huh. Give me a second. We'll fix that real quick. Why is there an echo? Maybe. Is it really bad? Is the guitar echoing too? How's that? Should be better, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Awesome. Yeah, I had uh, all the audio sources connected together. Sorry about that. I was saying, welcome to the live hangout, everyone. Except we already have some questions, so that's great. Don't be shy, and if uh, you see that I have not responded to your question, you, you can feel free to ask it again. But I'm gonna start with the first one that I think was interesting, and it's going to be all the way up. This was before we even started the stream. There was a question uh, by Alex. Can you please show us a simple chord progression and choose any mode that harmonizes with that chord progression? So in other words, I guess the, the real question is how do you decide what mode or scale to use over a chord progression. And I kind of changed my approach recently, so that's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you about. But first, you need to understand where I came from. Prior to that, I would have a chord progression, say B minor maybe, and then maybe a an A major, where I had a ninth in there, so chord progression. for example, okay? So what I would do prior to that is look at these chords and ask myself, there you go. Ask myself, okay, if I look at these chords, how can they match a scale? And so I would start thinking of uh, a scale degrees, right? Okay, this could be a six, five, four, but that got kind of confusing to me, because there was a lot of uh, analyzing things or trying to analyze things before having the full picture, especially when you're playing, uh, jamming with people and you don't know the chord progression first. So this is what I do. I think this is gonna help you, Alex. Basically, I kind of gather information as I'm hearing the first thing that happens. So let's say you have a chord. Uh, we'll go back to B minor, okay. What do I know of this chord? Um, and that's, that's a big shift because before that, I would look at the chord and ask myself, what could this chord be? But could is kind of conditional, right? It's not a certitude. And when you improvise, I can't, you can't afford to not have an well, I mean, I, I guess you can, you should take your risk, risks, but I wanted to minimize the guesswork. So what I've been doing is this, I've got my chord, just the first chord, a B minor. And that tells me that all the notes that are heard here can be played in a lead. So if it's a B minor, well, we've got a, a root, a minor third, a fifth, Maybe a minor seventh, if the seventh is played. So those are four notes already that I could use. So I could start phrasing with just this. Mm -hmm. 
Just the notes of the chord. That's it. And then if a second chord comes into the picture, let's say I got an A9. All right, that A9 tells me that on that A9, or A major if you want, I could play the notes of A major. Super simple, right? Matching, matching elements together. So on that chord, I could play the notes of A major. But where it becomes interesting is that now, that A major is part of this chord progression, right? So if I superimpose that B minor chord on top of the A major, well, all of those notes together will give me a kind of a scale, right? Or the beginning of a scale. And I could just go off the positions. So seven, nine, Let's see, we have a B minor seven, seven, nine, seven, 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 are notes that I could play. And on the next chord, if it's this shape, I have frets five, seven, seven, six, five, five. So I could superimpose those together, and I would have the beginning of a scale. And then I can start adding to the picture as new chords happen. So it's less of a guessing game, more of a looking at the chords instead of trying to bring all those chords to a common scale, because that can lead into problems if you have a chord that's not part of the scale. So I hope that I, I don't want to just uh, give you the full method, because I, I, I think on guitar or anything related to art, if I tell you this is exactly how you do it, then it's not gonna serve you. But I think that's enough for you to start exploring and you'll find, I think, some new ideas and new things like that. But that's a great question, Alex, and I'm, I'll make some follow-ups if you'd like. Looks like we have a lot of neighbors here. It's people from Loveland, hey Tim. I saw a Boulder guy earlier. For those of who don't know, yep, Boulder here. Flight 484, hey, see a lot of friends here. Um, I'm in, in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. And that's great, guys, everyone. Okay, so because we have so many people in the chat, I'm afraid that I'm gonna miss some questions. And I know I did already, so feel free to repost them, and that's fine. And I'll develop a little bit more on this uh, idea of not trying to find the scale or the mode, but really phrase on the chords. So I've got a backing track here. Let's do a little bit of playing. Um, the first thing that I will do on a backing track is nothing as far as the guitar goes. Just really just listen and see what happens. Okay. I don't really know the chords. I don't have a perfect ear. But I can gather the tempo. So I've got that. Already, I know that when I'm playing, it's gonna be over this. That kind of phrasing, okay. I can feel the pattern, the repetition. I'm gonna play one note. Bear in mind, I don't know the key here. So, let me pause this for a sec. You might say, well, what if you play the wrong note? Well, here's the, here's the thing. In Western music, as opposed to Eastern, like some Indian countries have more, but in Western music, rock, pop, jazz, all that, there are 12 tones, okay, 12 notes, 12 possible notes on the guitar. And you can see that, right? From the open string, which happens to be an E, all the way to the next E is 12. So we have 12 possible notes. There's another thing. Uh, typically, when I say typically, I mean all the time. <laughs> you can, there are seven possible notes that you can play over any chord. So, if you think about it, seven out of 12, you have more chances of hitting a right note than a wrong note. Not tons, but, but still, so that should help. Let's play, play a note, just starts with a note. So I'm hearing this. I've got my, my tempo, 
and I'm gonna go for a note. I haven't hit a wrong note, <laughs> but it's okay. If that happens, I think I can try to fix it. It's a little bend, right? Once I have one note, that's all it takes. So let's say that I know that this note works. And here I'm hitting the second string, 15th fret. Okay, I know that that works. That's great, that's awesome. From there, my strategy is gonna be to try to build from that note or find the rest of the seven notes. And once I have those seven, it's gonna be way easier. So I've got this. Now from here, I could go up or down, right? And here's the other thing. It kind of has to do with uh, Alex's question here. The other thing is, um, you know I told you there's seven possible notes we could play on, on any chord? Okay, 99.9% 9, 99 .9 of the time. Um, the widest distance between two notes is gonna be two frets. Not always, I know, most of the time. So if you can hear before playing what the sound of two frets higher or one fret higher or two frets lower or one fret lower is, then you can kind of figure out the rest of the scale, right? So I'll try to do that with you. So I've got this note. I'm hearing this. I can't sing it, it's a little high. La, la, an octave lower. La. That works, that sound works, right? Okay, I'll take it an octave lower. La. Okay, so if I hear this track. La. Okay, I know where that is, right? Because I just played it. Now, a half step higher or a full step higher? It's gonna be one of those, right? Happy birthday is two frets higher. So if you can sing that. Happy birthday to you, la da da. Does that sound good? La da. If not, it's gonna be one fret higher. To me, it doesn't sound good. So it's one fret higher. Yeah, we got two notes out of seven now. Through to an octave higher. So it's fret 15 and 16. Now from 16. Happy birthday. Does that work? Yeah. So two parts higher. And so forth. Now I just use one song, but the more songs you have in your mind you can associate with intervals, the faster it's gonna be. I'm getting more comfortable with this, so that's what I did there. Kind of quickly, but I, I, I figured out my scale. I still don't know the name, but I have the sound. A little modulation. Still don't know the scale, but it's all with associating those um, intervals, those notes, with sounds. One fret higher, two frets higher. One lower, two lower. Make sense? Okay. Um, Chance is asking, how can you tell what tuning a song is? Well, I'm assuming you're talking about guitar tunings. Right. Is it standard? Is it drop D? Is it? And you'll hear it eventually, but to get there, I think you need to try to figure out how it's played. And if you're trying to figure out how a song is played that has been written in an open tuning and, and it's just weird fingerings, like you end up doing stuff like, like this, like really difficult fingering, well, try to untune one of the strings and make it easier. Most likely, that's how it is done. Unless, you know, you're Alan Hallsworth or something like that. Sorry, wrong window. But that's kind of the, 
the idea. Typically, the simplest way to play something is the way it was recorded, usually. But yeah, the thing with scales too is, in addition to finding the, the, the actual notes that you're, I was gonna say allowed to play, you're allowed to play anything you want, but the notes that will sound um, good for the most amount of people, once you have that, thinking of the rhythm, you know, talked about it so many times, but it's, it's been a lifesaver for me. So instead of thinking in terms of notes and arpeggios and things like that, I'm just thinking in terms of the... So if you have just a few notes... Okay, these notes. Great, so... Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> But that's, that's <laughs> just thinking in terms of uh, rhythm and things like that is, is really going to help. I missed some questions, I know. Please repeat them. See the screen, I had to make my screen super big, which is over there so that I can read it. But then I only have that much amount of space to have. But I do see a question from my friend, Strange Device which now is gone because <laughs> people are, are typing. But let me go back up here. Okay, all right, man. So, glad you joined. How do you mute notes in, say, an arpeggio so that they don't ring out over the next note? Strumming or fretting hand? Or a mix of both? So, for me, it's, it's a mix of both, for sure. But the left hand is really the most important to me. So check this out. The left hand, which is the fretting hand, like right on the fingertip, right, or just a little bit below, like you're fretting that note, right? And I talked about this in a video where um, blowing the lid on the biggest guitar secret, um, it was clickbait, yes. But I think there was some value to it. But um, using the fleshy part of the finger here, that's something I omitted from that video. One of the reasons, if you play kind of flat like this on the neck, instead of like straight up, which is more of a classical guitar way, um, the, one of the advantages of playing a little bit flatter is that you will have more of the flesh under making contact with the strings under here, right? Almost like a bar, you're not really barring. I'm not really barring there, I'm not putting pressure. I'm only putting pressure on the string that I'm, I wanna fret. So in this case, it's the fourth, or let's do it on the sixth. Let's say I wanna play this note right here on the fifth fret, sixth string. Well, my finger is kind of flat here because it is putting, it is touching, making contact with the fifth and fourth string a little bit so that if I, accidentally hit that note, it's muted by the finger of the left hand. Now you could use your, your palm too, but I find that difficult, especially when you have to pick. <clears throat> so the muting is done with the left fingers, most of it. So anytime I'm playing a note, regardless of the, the finger that I'm using, say that I'm playing notes on the sixth string there. So frets five, six, seven, eight. See how flat my fingers are? And that's because my index, in this case, is putting, is, is having contact on the fifth and fourth string. They're muted. Same with the middle finger, flat, because I'm putting contact here, right there. This string is being muted by the fact that my finger is flat. Same with the ring finger, muted for the fifth string. Pinky is flat too, because of that reason. 
So I never really play like this finger straight because that prevents me to mute the fifth string. See, it's not blocked. So I never play like this super straight. I used to, and that created things like this. See all the additional noises? Ah, oh, yuck. But if I have my fingers flat, everything is muted. Now here's the other thing. If I'm playing anything but the sixth string, another reason I'm playing flat like this is that not only is the, the point of contact with the string like around here, and then anything below my finger or fingers are muting all the strings below, but also the pointy part of my index and my other fingers when they're fretting is muting the string above. So if I'm playing the fifth string, I'm flat here, right? My fingers are flat, but my, the, the very point of my index finger or the other fingers is also making contact with the sixth string. So fingers flat is really gonna help you. Does that, does that make sense? I hope that that's helpful. But yeah, fingers flat is really the, I think the best way to do that. Matthew, you have a good question here. What's the best way to just start improvising on your own? No backing tracks, just sitting back, playing simple chords and, and, and just playing on your own. That's great. And I think that's a very good way to do it. So I'll switch to a different sound. So that's the first thing. Find a sound that you're comfortable with, interested in, in playing. Um, thanks, those V picks are great. I love them. So I've got a clean tone here. And what I would do to start improvising is just, just make sure your mind is right. Just don't do anything. Just when I say mind is right, try to get rid of any anxiety. Now it, it can be hard. Um, if you're doing something like this, there's a bunch of cameras around. There's a little bit of anxiety in me. So maybe not the best way to do it, but I'll try anyways. But that's the first thing. Don't, don't just jump into it. Just breathe. Just, it's just you and you're going to tell, play something that really matches you. That's the first thing. So let's start just playing something. Maybe start with a chord or, or anything. Like I'll, I'll just start with, with this. Really like this chord. So we'll start with this. That's gonna be our starting point. So this right here, from the low E string to the high E string, this is open. Could have been anything, right? I'm doing this, could have been this or this, it doesn't matter, but that's what I'm gonna start. That's, that breaks the silence. So this is zero, open string. Then I'm doing a bar here on the 11th fret, so index is barring there. So zero, 11, pinky is playing 14. Then I've got the bar that's catching the third string here on the 11th fret. So zero, 11, 14, 11. Middle finger is playing 12 and then the bar again on the 11th. That. that broke the silence, right? Okay, so that's the first opening statement. Just let it ring and start imagining a tempo. Now, because you're not playing over a backing track or anything like that, you could just, it could be ad lib, it's okay. And then I would start playing a few notes of the chord. Don't go outside yet, but just, Try to visualize that and see this as a scale. So 0, 11, 14, 11, 12, 11. Okay. Just build some phrases like that. Maybe repeat it. You know that it'll fit, right? I'm just playing around that chord. And then maybe imagine uh, something on your that you want to hear over this. Ooh, I like that. Now, depending on where you're at, you might not be able to play that right away. That's okay. Just pause. You have the idea. That's improv. Right? You are improvising. It's just coming out from a different 
way in, of your body coming out through your mouth. Because I don't have to think about how am I going to put the muscles in my mouth to, to produce that sound. La, I don't have to think about it because I've used my mouth my whole life um, talking. And it's just a matter of learning how to replicate na -da -ba 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 with your guitar, what muscles are involved and all that. So figure it out on your own. La ba, na ba ba, cha cha. Okay. Na da da ba ba. Great. Okay. Do it again or with another idea. La da ba ba. Eventually, it's going to get faster and faster, and that's how I would start. At some point, if you feel like, ah, oh, I'm, I'm getting a little complacent here, change the chord. Just imagine. But it all starts with playing a shape and making up something, not with your guitar, with your imagination. Sing it first, and then learn how to say it with your fingers. I think that's where it starts, really. Um, and, and really, I would say, for at least for me, it, it hasn't worked to engage the mathematical theory mind has not worked for me when I improvise because then it comes out as forced mathematical and it, it, it hasn't helped. It has helped me understand things, but so really try to try not to understand what you're playing first. Do it after. I think that will help. Talal Music is asking about the sweeping, but sweeping isn't improving while improvising, nor are they cleaner. Any tips? For me, sweeping, I'd say economy picking more, which is very similar, is the kind of technique that I have to keep up at, and I haven't lately, so it's not great. But there was a time when I really, I was really frustrated with my playing. I thought it was probably about... Um, is it too loud? I hope not. About, I don't know, four years ago, I, I felt just really frustrated with where I was at. And I kind of revisited economy picking and sweeping, which I never understood. And that's the time when I was doing it every single day with little, tiny little exercises, micro exercises. For example. And I would just play very slowly and accurately until you know that you, you, you're going to get a little bit of fatigue and a little bit of pain. But eventually, it, or to me, it has to get to a point where that point, that uh, pain feels good. But it's got to be very controlled. Um, as far as like very practical ways to do to um, cleaning it up. I think for me, the putting your fingers flat, like I like I talked about earlier, to strange device has really helped putting the fingers flat because that has been key to muting everything. And for a long time, I was stuck because I thought for sweeping in particular, my fingers had to be very straight. But that that created a lot of problems. Flattening them has really cleaned it up. Not very clean, because I said... Like I said earlier, I haven't kept it up, but I think flattening your fingers is really going to help you a lot. Um, and also, I would say, 
there, I, I don't know if it's still the case, but I remember when I was in my late teens, early 20s practicing, there was like this thing where people said, yeah, you get really have to practice clean, you know, stop playing with distortion, it'll clean up. I kind of disagree because I feel with distortion, there's actually a lot of stuff, a lot more noise that you need to cover. So if it sounds clean with a lot of gain, which it doesn't hear, but if it does, then that's a good indication that you are, are um, doing it right as far as the technique goes. But I don't know, but it's just me. Um, what else can you play over a D minor single chord vamp in D Dorian? D minor pentatonic, D minor Dorian. So Daniel, you kind of answered your question. You, you, over a D minor Dorian vamp, you can play the notes of D Dorian and you're gonna be understood by most people musically. Let, let's, let's try this. But I, I guess what you're asking is maybe not so much the notes, but more the like concepts, ideas. And for that, I have a few ideas that, that I could show you. I'm looking for a backing track here. I have some uh, tracks that are just perfect for that. Um, so minor, D minor Dorian. Okay, here's something in D minor Dorian. So what I would say is you can play all the notes of D Dorian, right? We know that. So there's seven. Those are the notes you can play. You said, could I play a minor pentatonic? Oh, you said I could play a minor pentatonic? Yeah, of course, but you're still playing Dorian, right? You're just skipping some notes of D Dorian. But the first thing that I would say is, or the only thing I would say is just really think in terms of rhythm. So D Dorian. It sounds like your question it has more to do with um, not so much concepts, but scales and things like that. So D Dorian is D Dorian, but you could play um, in Breakwater. I'm going to get back to you in a sec on this. It's a good question. Where D Dorian is D Dorian, I guess you could venture outside. So some notes are not going to be Dorian, so they're going to sound bad on their own. Like this, for example. Right? Or this. But that's okay. Because you're not just playing those notes. So you could play maybe D minor 7 flat 5. I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. But that'll sound like this. If you like that sound. The reason it kind of works because there's a note that doesn't work, right? The, the, that one. But the reason it kind of works is that we've got D Dorian from that D Dorian scale or mode, however you want to call it. We can extract a, we find a hidden minor pentatonic, right? And typically when you have a minor pentatonic, you could play minor blues, right? with a flat five. It's kind of accepted. Okay. Now if we take the notes of D Dorian and that D, that D minor pentatonic with a blue note, and if we combine them, we can find a hidden minor seven flat five. Right, we have our, our root, minor third, flat five, which is the blue note, 
and then minus 7. And then if you think in terms of rhythm, you can also really play whatever you want, it doesn't matter. I don't know what I played, but because it was rhythmically interesting, you kind of were able to follow along. This is maybe not the best example. This works best if the track is a little bit faster, because at this slower pace, you, your ear really has time to perceive some notes as bad, right? But that's kind of the idea. I wanted to touch really quick on Breakwater Communities Church's question, did Dorian oversee? So I know exactly why you're talking about this, why you say that, and you're seeing modes as all relative to each other, which they are, but I don't think that's gonna serve you, personally. It never served me. It serves some people, but basically the idea is that you have a major scale. Let's say you have a C major scale, okay? And that, that's not the way I do it, but I'll, I'll go back to the um, origins of these modes. So you've got a C major scale. Okay. Okay. If you start that C major scale from its second note, you have a Dorian, a D Dorian position. So in other words, C major or C Ionian equals the notes of D Dorian equals the notes of E Phrygian equals the notes of F Lydian. Okay, we've heard that before, and that's true. And that creates a lot, that cre has created a lot of confusion for me because I thought, well, um, what's the point then? If all of these modes are equal to each other, why not just learn the major scale and go from there? Well, then I, I realized a while back that, well, there's some songs that are really written in certain modes, like this one right here that we just played over is D Dorian, right? Oh, man, okay. How do I do this? Well, then I thought, well, if D Dorian equals C Ionian, I'm just gonna play with C Ionian, right? It works. The problem is I'm always going back to a major scale. And when I'm thinking in terms of major scale, I'm thinking in terms of, of a position. And when I'm playing in a position, thinking of the position, then all my licks are gonna be kind of tied to that position. Oh, horrible playing, but you, you get it, right? It's all locked into that position. And that's that can be a big problem because in, you, you're, are no longer creating music, you're letting the scale position create the music. So I don't know if that opens a door of understanding. I hope it does a little bit, but that's it for theory. Diamond Lou, it's okay. <laughs> um, you don't need theory to play at all, but it helps. <laughs> but I would say don't, don't start with theory, start with playing and then try to understand what you're playing if you're interested in it. Okay. Um, okay, questions are flooding. Okay, hang on, hang on, hang on. Andrew, why not play C major focusing on D note? So yeah, exactly, that's, that's the reason is that you are always, the, the fact that you're saying why not playing C major, a major scale, tells me that you're thinking in terms of the position of major, and then you're gonna be locked into the position. And yeah, you can try to focus on D, but, but um, the, you're still very much locked into a position, and, the, and when you're locked into a position, it influences the way you play, because some fingerings are too weird in others. Um, so yeah, Gary, um, I'm not from Paris, I'm from uh, Aix-en-Provence. 
originally, south of France. But I moved, I'm, I'm Franco-American. My mom is from America, my dad is French, but I grew up, was born in South France, but I moved here about 18 years ago. And now I live two hours away from Colorado Springs, but I'm a French native, not, not American, uh, English is my second language. Um, all right, RG, thanks for being here. Can you comment on chord sets, triads, and not defying the common notes for lead transition? So I don't really think that way, but I can talk a little bit about the triad stuff. I think I see triads as blocks. So imagine that you have, a, a, you've got to play a lead over, we'll go back to the chords we used earlier, B minor, A major, and G major, okay? So I can extract those triads, right? From B minor, I would have a B minor triad. A major. Oops, sorry. Or really this, right? And then G, these three triads. I see those as stepping stones. So if I want to cross the river, if, there, if there's a, a river to be crossed, that's the space you have to improvise. I could, uh, it's, it's gonna be a little bit hard for me to keep it interesting in a span of a minute or something like that. And at some point, if I have to improvise over that, I'm gonna start getting into my head too much and my lead is not gonna flow. So I'm gonna use those stones to cross the river. I can get on one of these stones and rest a little bit and then look at the next stone instead of looking all the way to the end of the solo. And in between the stones, I can, I can swim, freeform a little bit, play with the full scale. Those stones are those triads. So if I improvise now over this, instead of thinking of the full scale. I'll think of those stones. So the first stone is that A. So that's kind of how I would look at the, the triad things. I don't know if that answered your question, but that's kind of how. Just as tools to kind of rest, take a breath, and go to the next one. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Um, Ezreal, I, do, I, have, I don't have these uh, live events every month. I have them just randomly. Um, maybe we should. Super Jet, are you talking about the about Satriani's Rubi, Rubina? I love that song. Is it the da 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 ba ba na na ba na or something like that? I can't remember. <laughs> um, William, it seems like uh, the solo artists we all love don't really play straight church modes. They use hybrid modes like Phrygian dominant, Hungarian modes. It depends really on the music you're into. It, it really depends, but I think a lot of them do use those modes without necessarily knowing them, but it doesn't matter. But I think most of them do. I, I guess it depends on the style of music. But really, as a, the one thing I would say about this is that as a uh, player, if you are playing over something or with someone or for someone, you really don't have many choices as far as which scale to use. Because you, as a player, if you want to be appreciated musically by other people, then the, the, the scale is really given to you by the chords you're playing over. Um, no matter how hard you try, you can't say, no, I'm playing this if the chord doesn't tell you so. I'm, I'm going to load up another backing track here. Let's do, um, I don't know. All those tracks are available on, on my website. I'll leave a link under, uh, I have a deal right now where you can get two, 250 backing tracks, all of these that I'm using here for $27. Okay. This, for example, I don't, I don't really know the key, so I'll figure it out just like I, I explained to you earlier. 
See, I played a note randomly and it worked because I have more chances of making a note work than not, right? Just because of the way that it's built. I don't know the key. Okay. Um, so here. Looks like I'm in A flat minor. That works. No matter how hard I try, I'm never gonna be in. I don't know. B flat uh, Locrian. It kind of works, but no, I'm always attracted to that A flat because I'm in that the chords tell me that. So the chords are always going to tell you what to, to play over. Um, just no key, why are chord changes necessary? I don't think they are necessary. They can be interesting, but they're not necessary. There's some great songs with no chord changes. Are you talking about chord changes or key changes? I was going off of the key change. But if you're thinking of changing chords, it's, it's maybe a little more interesting, but it doesn't have to be the case. Um, okay, uh, Como, I think you asked that question earlier. Thanks for reposting it. How to nail the blues micro bends and quarter bends? Okay, great question. I think it has a lot more to do with your ear than with uh, the technique. You've got to hear it first. So I, I would just play a note. So let's, let's take our A minor pentatonic scale, okay? And we'll take this note right here on the second string. So second string, eighth fret, which is part of that minor pentatonic scale, right? So from that eighth fret to the next fret, nine, that'll be a half step, right? So that's the smallest distance we have on a keyboard. But if you're bending that, you have all these other tones, right? That's what you're talking to about, about in the micro quarter bands and things like that. So you kind of have to hear the in-between. See, it sounds out of tune, right? It's not out of tune. That's what you're aiming for. And that adds a certain amount of um, um, imperfection in a way in your music. Kind of sounds a little imperfect. I'm, I'm looking for another track here. Maybe we'll pull up a blues track. Um, it, it sounds a little imperfect, but it's cool. Let's, let's do this in G, okay? So we're in G minor pentatonic. Here's a, a blues in G. So let's take this note, one fret higher. It sounds imperfect, right? It sounds really bad. But that's because I'm really accentuating that. Oh, horrible. <laughs> but if you inject that a little bit, it'll add a, a, a little bit of imperfection and that's, that sounds kind of cool. I did it there, right? That's horrible, but... Another one is uh, this, so you're, you've got a full step bend, and then you release it to sound like the half step. So. So you, you release really quick. And 
and so forth. Do you, have you heard of a guitar player, um, Jimmy Herring? Jimmy Herring is uh, the guy who um, does that a lot. He's, I, want, I love that sound and he's the one that kind of made me aware of, of those types of bands. So I would recommend listening to him, but it has to do a lot with just really listening to it. Um, but yeah, it, it, it has this imperfection, which is perfect. Perfect imperfections. Love that. Gary Moore, yeah. All those guys, Jeff Beck. Um, which, which another way is to actually, instead of playing your scale that's going to work, like the G minor pentatonic in this case, you play it a half step below. So instead of uh, G, it'll be G flat. It sounds horrible. But if you bend each of these notes a half step above, it sounds like you're drunk, but that's okay. Because that's just the first step. The next step is to pre-bend those notes, try to make it sound like, like you're not bending it. It's gonna be a little imperfect. Like that. Now inject that every once in a while. Does that make sense? Kind of gives you a Jeff Beck thing, and that's why I use the fingers too. It, it just really helps. I really like playing that way. Um, another example of imperfect that sounds really good, I think. All right, Corey, talk about common bends that are used. Um, I, I kind of went away from those because I feel that, I, I, I get your question. I was interested in finding those common bends, but then I was really locked into playing the same bends over and over. And that was a big problem because all my leads sounded the same. So what I would suggest instead of thinking of common bends, so we're back to that G minor, I'll play in this position. Instead of playing those common bends, I would suggest just looking at any note of the scale and bending to that note. It'll add a little bit of surprises, I think. Right? So that's a note of the scale. So you look at the full scale and try to bend to each of these notes. They're all gonna be right. So if you consider, okay, I'm gonna be, you know what, let's, let's change tracks to kind of clear our, our uh, ears a little bit. Let's do, um, let's still stay in the minor type thing. We'll do something in E minor, E Dorian, okay? So we're in E Dorian. All these notes can be bended too. So bend to each of these notes. better result.
<laughs> and, and then I experienced the freak out, which I referred to before. It's like when my mind can't keep up with what I'm, what I'm playing and that creates that thing. It's that anxiety that comes when you're playing or when I play. Uh, okay. What did I miss? <laughs> and you know, I, I know I missed some questions. Feel free to repost. Can blues be integrated with other music genres? Definitely the edge. It's done all the time. And vice versa too. Going back up, trying to see. Any opinions on capos? Yeah, Gary, capos are great, especially if you are, um, well, if you're working with a singer, but th there's another thing with capos too, is that um, the more open strings you get, I think, the fuller the guitar is gonna sound. And you might say, well, I could bar a note, but it's not gonna sound the same because when you're barring, no matter how hard you, you, you do it, you're never gonna have the same exact perfect amount of pressure, but a capo does that. And that'll allow your string to resonate a lot more um, than if you're barring it. So I think capos are great. If you have a repeating thing, I don't have a capo here, but. This, it sounds okay, but with a capo it would sound a lot better because I'd have the same exact pressure on each strings and those strings are really gonna resonate. You're gonna hear the difference. It, it's really gonna be, make a big difference. And if you're, re, for those of you recording, when this happens, I suggest having one, uh, one track where you're playing this with a capo and the other one without and you pan them you'll hear a little bit of differences and that's really going to make it richer too. Just a little recording trick. Okay, let me go back down now because I'm back at 2.20, 2.30 now. Um, Diamond, that's awesome. Thanks so much for stopping by. That's great, I'm glad you were here. Guitar Wankery. What picking technique should you start practicing? It took me a long time to figure out which one. Um, I, I, would, I would say first decide what sound you like best. Do you like the sound of, I, I'm not an alternate picker, but do you like the sound of alternate picking where, where you, you really hear the aggress, uh, aggression in those? Do you like this? Or do you like the smoother of the economy picking? Or maybe you don't even like picking at all. You prefer the legato type. So go with the sound you like first and then give it enough chance to develop because it's, it's not gonna sound great first. And I think those are the kinds of things that you really need to maintain. And I, I hope that you don't think that I'm talking as if I have it figured out, because I really don't at all. But I think that's the, that's what I would say. Go with the sound you like, and that will tell you which technique you should play with. Henry, how do you use the major second interval in Dorian mode? You just use it like any other note. You just use it as a regular note. Each note is valid. So we were in the E Dorian here, so that major second. It's a valid, it's just, you use it like any other note. And I kind of see this as improv imp improvisation. This is a story that's already being told. I'm just adding a few details. And the tools I use to add the details, like maybe I'll, maybe this is a story, you've got a big uh, plain, a meadow, and there's a cabin here and a big mountain. Well, I'm just gonna add a tree with that second. Adding details. And I've got seven possible sounds to add those details. They're all valid. This one is, that's the one, the two, the five, three, 
Don't, I would not think of notes as how do I use it, but how um, can you play it and then combine it with other notes. And I wouldn't even think in terms of what note should I land on. Any. So um, I hope that answers your question, but you're free to use it as, as however you want to use it. And if you don't like it, don't use it. There's no right or wrong either. Um, funky, the, the, are you t this amp is a Rev Generator 740. It's a great amp. It's not plugged in, right? Oh, all of this, nothing is plugged in <laughs> except for the Axe FX2. And the reason is a year and a half ago, there was a flood here in the studio. So I had to take out all the gear and uh, I still haven't plugged it back in <laughs> because I'm renting this space and, and we're thinking we're going to find, we've been looking for a home for like five and a half years, still haven't found it to have my studio in it. And several times we thought, oh, we're close. And but no, it's been, been here three years now. Anyways. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, I, I have not taught Ida Nielsen or I, I don't know who she is. Or maybe I do, but I forgot. If you could have just three pedals, what would they be? Corey, I'll just answer for me, but, uh, this, this not, it's probably not your answer. I think it, it really has to do with what you, the music you play and the sound in your head. But me, for me, I would, I would have a compressor. I would have a um, distortion pedal or overdrive. And then it depends. If my amp doesn't have reverb, I'd get a reverb pedal. But if my amp has reverb on it already, I'd get a delay. Uh, Curtis amp or, or pedal? You mean changing the, the drive on the amp or using a pedal? I think that's what you're saying. I like pedals, but that's only because that's what I've been using. Oh, Funky, thank you very much. That's so nice of you, thank you. All right, um, Stonk, you think the housing market is about to tank? I don't know, I hope so, I, I don't know. It'd be nice. Um, I haven't played a Westone Thunder Japanese guitar, but I have played a, oh no, it wasn't a Westone. So no, I haven't. I don't know Barry Harris, but I'll check him out. How to practice double stops. Um, I think just like anything else you want to practice and it would be by making music. So I, even exercises just try to make music with it. So I don't know if I've got a, if I want to work on double stops, which is like two notes, I would just improvise and try to make music with it. And even with, um, Exercises that you would do, like, um, I think I just posted something on, on one of the shorts, but let's say, you know the spider exercise, like, or like any kind of chromatic thing. Just make a, try to make music with it. Something like that. Major upgrade, my favorite looper is the Eros by Singular Sound. Uh, I reviewed it a week ago on the channel and it's really, really good, but it's not the cheapest, but it's really good. Um, 
because um, it's all controllable with your foot. You can mix with your foot. Um, you can store tons and tons and tons of space. You can have up to six tracks, six parts. So that would be my favorite one. But that said, I think I haven't really ever used a looper that I have not enjoyed because just the concept itself is so great. Um, Kim, thank you. You're, you're very nice. How can I play lyrics? I'm not sure what you mean. So lyrics like are song words, right? So I'm not sure what, if you can rephrase that, that would be great. Uh, William, have I, have I ever have to dial down my reverb because of the natural reverb in the location? No. Um, no, I haven't. But when I used to gig, it was mostly small spaces or, um, or through the PA, my amp mic'd up. And in that case, because it's mic'd up, um, the sound of the, I guess, fake reverb, non-room reverb is the one that's mic'd up and, and transmitted. So if it was a small place, I, it, it, there's always a lot of people like a bar or a club or something like that. And it doesn't really reverb much. It doesn't echo much. So no, I never had to. Um, James, I've used it with the Beat Buddy. Yes. And it's great because it syncs, it syncs up perfectly. It's really, really fun. Are metronomes evil? No, you're not. Tips on improving vibrato. Um, it, uh, first, be aware of the types of vibratos that there are. There's the wide one, the subtle one, the circular, vi-ish type of. So be aware of the different types. That's the first thing. And then, what I would tell myself, because I'm not very good at vibrato. I've got more of a, a uncontrolled vibrato. I would say being aware of the, the space. Da, 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 and pick a subdivision. Da, 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 for example. Try to do it in tempo. Or maybe. Yeah, just try to do it in tempo. I think that would really help you. So if you wanted to play the lyrics of a song, I think it makes sense. Um, I would approach it with a little more liberty. So let's say that I've got some lyrics. All right, I've got this album here. Extreme, so we'll take some lyrics, okay? New York City can be so pretty. All right, take that. I can't remember the melody of the song, but let's say that we've got um, a track. New York City can be so pretty. We're going to sing that first. So we've got a track here. And what I would start with is just trying to find a melody first. New York City can be so pretty. Okay, baby.
<laughs> it's cheesy, but the cheesier the better. New York City can be so pretty. Okay, na da 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 na. So I'd find that on the guitar. Let's say that that's the, those are the real lyrics, okay? So I'm playing that. Then I would vary that to a variation. So instead of, and it's cheesy when you sing it, but when you play it, it's not. So maybe New York City can be so pretty. A little variation. Almost like a rapper would. See, you got, I, I got caught in playing. <laughs> I, it probably didn't answer your question. I'm sorry if it didn't. But it was fun. All right. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Eminem, thank you. So I, I saw some comments on this. Yeah, this is a, my Vola guitar. It's kind of a, been my main guitar for the last five years or so. And I have another one in the back. The, the, the first Vola that I got was this one right here. It's a Vola Oz model. My friend Robert Baker introduced me to the guys at Vola. So you should check those out. I think you'd really like them. And I do. They send me this one, which I love. And then I asked them if they could make me a roasted maple neck because I've always been curious about it and this is what that one is. And it's also an Oz model, but it's an Oz RMN, roasted maple neck. And this, I think this has been my main guitar. I really love it. It's perfect for, for me, I think. Really enjoy it. Ouais, je sais que je chante pas très bien. Merci en tout cas. Um, any last minute question? Really appreciate everyone being here. This has been really, really nice. Breakwater, uh, thanks for asking. No, I haven't been to NAM. I don't have any 2022. Uh, competitions, yeah, what do you have in mind, Jordan? That would be fun. Okay, Japanese, I will answer. I play both acoustic and electric with a thumb pick. How can I play single notes? Line? Oh, I can't answer that one because I don't really use thumb picks. I'm, I'm not, I don't know. I'm so sorry. William, thank you for the nice comments on the DNA course. It's a free course that's in the link under if you'd like to participate. It's the music theory DNA course, it's free. Um, Everyone, thanks so much. I know there's more questions here that I haven't answered, but we'll do this again. And I really appreciate all the questions and uh, all of that. If you missed your question, I'll, I'll have another one of these coming up soon. And thanks so much, everyone. 
I'll leave the link below for those backing tracks. It's uh, 250 backing tracks for $27, $27. And all the tracks that I used here. Anyways, thanks so much, everyone. Have a good rest of your day, morning, evening, and I'll talk to you guys very soon. Thanks so much, everyone. Really appreciate you. Talk to you soon.